Tomorrow, who, you know, might know who we are. I'm Sheila Hassan. This is my husband, Bill. We're both um, FFI Master Certified uh, Casting Instructors, and we've been teaching for, I, I, I don't even know, but it's like, who cares, over 25 years. And uh, we've been bone fishing for 30 years or more. And we're, hey, how you doing? Good, how you doing? Good. This is like a little stool there, yeah, chair over there. there. Um, just like a little FYI. I love bone fishing. You'll never pick that up because it is, to me, it, it, it contains all of the skills that you would want for any other particular type of, of fly fishing that you want. You have to have accuracy. You have to have stealth. You have to cast distance, and it's like, and you have to have incredible precision. So it's not. There's nothing about it that isn't a good skill to have for any other kind of fishing that you're going to do. But, a lot of you may not know this, bone fishing is actually how I started my fly fishing career. So we actually were spin fishermen, you know, everybody says, oh, you got to like to try the fly rod, we did, we tried it, you know, bone fishing of course with a nine weight, and I was horrible at it, but that's because you didn't have instructors around back then. So, long story short, got my act together, um, but it still is like the kind of fishing that I'm most passionate about. I love our striped bass. I'm not disrespecting the bass or the blues, but I will be honest with you, it's only out of convenience. If I had both, both <laughs> <laughs> striped bass on the right, I'd never go to the right. Yeah. If we live 40 minutes away from bonefish, we'd probably fish for bonefish. <laughs> All the time. But yeah. So anyway, why don't you say a few things about yourself and then we can uh, get going. Bill Hassan, I've been teaching with Sheila for about 25 25 years, we do most of the stuff with the Bears Den. Uh, we've been bone fishing a long, long time. I love bone fishing. It's taken us to all sorts of crazy places uh, in the world. Some trips were great, some trips were good, some trips not so good. But we've done a lot, we keep going back. We were in uh, Cuba a couple of weeks ago, our first trip to Cuba. We've been to Venezuela 26 times when you could still go there. Uh, it's like we found good bone fishing and we just kept going back. And the Florida Keys when they had And the it. Florida Keys, I mean every place, Bahamas, Turks and Caicos, I, I can't think. We've been there. Lot of, someone told me I've wasted a life bone fishing, but what do you do? There are worse ways to do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, today's presentation is going to be, is like I wrote, which may sound a little harsh. It's not a how I spent my winter vacation trip. It's kind of like to give you tips and tricks and kind of like what we do. I'm sure a lot of you have probably fished before and you say, well, I know a lot of this stuff. Well, if you can pick up one or two things uh, in the next 50 minutes, then that'll be great. Maybe it'll help you catch another fish, which is always good. And can I just ask for a show of hands, how many people have already been, I know there's many people have, but how many people have already been bone fishing before? Oh, only about a third or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's all right. Good. Well, that's good. So I think, unless we have too many questions, I think you could interrupt us as we go along if, if you do have questions. Um, that's yeah, and, yeah and if we say oh, we're going to cover that, you know, in, in five slides, trust me, we will. And if we don't, tell us we didn't, and we will cover it. Yeah. Because we, uh, we can talk forever, so especially we'll try not to. <laughs> I have to point this over here. All right. So if it's if you can't hear me well, I'll just jump up to the front. I don't know whether I should be here or there. I don't usually have such fancy equipment. I usually have just my HDMI cable goes right to the TV. So go ahead. Ready? Yeah. Success. And you know, again, why do you like it? You're warm. It's sunny. I mean, is there anything about this? And we were lucky enough, we've been lucky enough to catch some really big fish. So there's a lot of good reasons to like bone fishing. It's a great excuse for going away. And I just wanted to pause here for a moment. The beauty of this fish is amazing. I have to think I have to do it like this. No, I think, can I do it? Oh, I can do it. Yay. Do you see how you cannot even see his the rest of his mouth, which you'll find out about? But look at the clarity of the water, the glistening of the fish. I mean, they're just so amazing. I just, I just love them. First thing I want to talk about is just a little something about the fish itself. The distribution. There's actually a fairly wide distribution of, excuse me, I keep hitting his head, with of where the bonefish could be. 
if you read the literature, it says that the bonefish could come all the way up, halfway up the East Coast, though I've never seen them. Um, mostly in the nice warm places that we want to go in the middle of the winter anyway. Um, and they're different, I would say that there are different species of bonefish, they're not all the same. Obviously this doesn't have the uh, Seychelles in there too, because we know that they're at the Seychelles. So thinking about the habitat, so just to cover some stuff about the fish, when you're fishing for bonefish, for the most part, you, in general, you're going to be looking for shallow water. Okay? Shallow water where the fish can be feeding, finding crustaceans, shrimp, crabs, etc. Um, that are of interest to them. They love the sort of fringe feeders. They love all this stuff around the mangroves and ar around the base of the mangroves. The little um, turtle grass here. You know, it's just not uncommon to find them in that sort of spot. But the design of the body are amazing. How many people go albacore? It's false albacore fishing. Most, yeah, and, and anybody who does the salt water. And you know how you just love the speed of those fish? Well, man, the, the bonefish are even, even better, if you ask me. Why? Because they're amazing. They're built for speed. They're what they call fusiform, which means they're tapered on both ends. So their, their head and snout kind of comes down and is tapered. And then the back part is tapered. And then the tail is forked, which means it can really um, go fast. They have clocked the, bo the maximum speed or burst speed of a bonefish at 25 miles an hour. So it's pretty darn pretty good. All right, so this is just to show you an up close of how they're built for speed here with the nose and then that forked tail. That was supposed to make a nice little fast sound. I'm sorry it didn't make it. Let's see if I can make it. No, I think it's because of the, see the little yeah. sound there? It was going to go <laughs> It was very, I laughed every time I did it at home. <laughs> All right, camouflage. This, so as you probably already know, maybe I can stand up here, as you probably already know, bone fishing is not about, it's not at all like our striped bass fishing. It's not, you are not simply covering water. It's a combination of hunting and fishing. So that's part of the, the appeal to it, is that you don't get to just cast. You, you're supposed to, I mean, unless you're in a mud situation. For the most part, you have to first find the fish then you have to get the right cast of the fish. Can everybody see the fish? And yeah. That's mm -hmm. yeah, I think okay. that's an easy one. That, that one's no, that's an easy one. Okay. Okay. So, all right, there you go. So camouflage is part of the way that they survive. A couple of cool things here. Different. Each one of these pictures has um, has uh, some fish in it. Somewhere you can barely see. I keep thinking I'm going to press on one thing. There you go. You can barely see this fish here, but there's a fish in here. You, if you were to you get your eyes just right, there's a fish right here. Here's a fish in here. And then obviously you can see this one. So here's the cool thing. <coughs> they love to be in this clear water, but as you saw by the first picture, their sides are sort of mirrored when you look at them. So they tend to reflect back the coloration of whatever is on the bottom, or whatever type of bottom that they're on. So what that means is, on a white sand flat, the fish are going to seem translucent. They're going to seem like a shadow, hence the ghost of the flats. Okay. Notice also, uh, let me just finish up there. They have these um, the ability to change a little bit of the hue hmm. so that they can match the surroundings. So if you're on turtle grass, which I showed you earlier, where it's kind of mottled and a little brown, the fish are going to a little brown. There are areas that is going to be more mossy type and greenish to the water. They're going to have a little more green color. And then you're going to have these parts where it's all white and they're going to look like they don't have any color at all. But they all have this striation on the top, which is really cool because you never notice that about a fi the fish because you only get it when you sort of look from the top down. Um, but camouflage is the, probably the thing that makes it hardest to be able to catch the fish. Just a couple more pictures about it. You can see a suit. this is great because it has that marled appearance where you see all the turtle grass and the, the fish's ability to blend in. And here, I love this one because you barely see the head of that fish and you can just see the part that's out. So that's how well, I mean, this is, this is their job as we like to say. 
And that, this is actually, I love this photo because I got the shadow of the fish. We're going to talk a lot about how to see fish, but sometimes you're just going to see the shadow of the fish. So it's really very cool. And again, a fish that disappears into the water. So their feeding behavior. As I said, they're built for speed, but how they feed is important to know because it'll help you decide where you're likely to find the fish. Okay? So they, they obviously they feed through their mouth, but notice there's no teeth. So this is how the fish feed. Oh, excuse me. This, this is, I, I believe this is just to indicate that, the, that there is some tidal component to this, that the fish are going to tend to fish on the flats more when the water is coming up and it kind of brings fresh food in from the sea, or last meal is the getting out of Dodge when it's getting a little too low. Okay. Um, next thing I wanted to show is um, the mouth of the fish. So you see there's no teeth, right? So what they do is they actually inhale and then they have crushes sort of set back. So you don't have to worry about, not that you would lip a bonefish, but you don't have to worry about getting bit, but um, that's how, but they will squish really hard too when you're trying to take out a hook. So they have really strong jaws. Also notice right up in here, the two little holes on their snout. That's part of their feeding mechanism. So what they do is they like to feed in the more shallow water, they feed head down, and they blow out through that snout. So they're sort of like excavating the uh, bottom of that area, blowing away sand, seeing what scurries away. And that's and then they would inhale it and then crush it. That's their, that's their food. Now this is another cool feature about the fish. Their eyes. Their eyes actually have 360 degree rotation. They can see 360 degrees, and they they never close. They don't have like a, a close, you know, an eyelid. They have a, a clear. I almost said plastic, but a clear coating over the eyes that if you touch it on the bonefish, it would feel like it was the plastic coating on a headlight. That's what it feels like. It's just it's just very cool. So they have incredible vision. They obviously they have good um, sense of hearing and sound and their lateral lines, but that ability of how they feed is very particular. That's why you're usually fishing in these more shallow type of waters. And that's just an example. He obviously took a little crab pattern here and getting stuck way down in there. Perfect. Okay, so they feed in shallow waters. So what are they afraid of besides you, you know? Predators from above. So you can see you get your nice, whoops, I was gonna go back there, your, your uh, barracuda, okay? And sharks, but then predators from above. And this is very cool, see? Half a fish there, all right? So. When you might have heard stories about people saying, oh, when you cast over that area, don't cast directly over the fish because they'll see the shadow of the line. And they will. And they will think it's the fish coming down to grab them. A so, bird. excuse me. <laughs> yeah, a bird coming down to grab the fish. So you do need to be care I mean, be cautious of that. But those are their two big predators in the water and above the water. And I think. And now it's Bill's turn to talk about all the gear. That's it, go downstairs now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, talk a little bit about uh, bonefish gear. Having a... Can I ask a quick question? Yes, sure. of course. Like the typical size range that you catch them in. I'm sorry, so, size, it's so it varies uh, in terms of size of fish? Yeah. Totally, totally, totally varies. Depends on where you are what size, sort of slot size they tend to, you know, catch, so, or, or tend to have in that area. So when we go to Mexico, they all tend to be smaller fish. They might be like two pound fish. You catch them smaller than that, and you'll get them a little bit bigger than that. In Venezuela, we tended to catch fish where the average size fish was like six or seven pounds. Um, when we were fortunate enough to go to Cuba, we didn't catch a lot of fish, but the ones we did were all quality. All they were in the five, six pound fish. And I was like, oh my God, it's been a year since I caught a fish this big. I was like, beside myself. Because we have been fishing. <laughs> booking trip now. <laughs> Free Cuba, we have been fishing a lot in uh, Mexico and Belize since Venezuela shut down. And there are a lot of fish, but they were smaller fish. But back to Cuba, a lot larger fish. The Florida Keys has larger fish. The Bahamas has larger fish. If you, Granted, you know, they don't get big by being stupid. 
So, you know, Lodge of Fisher is sometimes If you really looked up the cat. world record, I think it's like in the 12-ish, maybe. <coughs> like the biggest of all the world records. I know I had a world record, but it was on a very light tippet and it was a smaller fish. But it's really hard to find fish that are, I mean, you might find some in the seven, eight, but even a 10 pound fish would just be like That's a trophy, rare. that's a fish that's of a rare. lifetime. You typically do guided trips? We do, so. because it's vacation. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so you use guides. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't well, mind, I know I could go on my own, but you know. Yeah, no, when we go, we, we I like guides. to drop it at the end of the day. We do enough of the guiding thing, yeah. you know, we don't have to yeah. rinse the motor and all that stuff. Yeah. But go and ahead. Plus, you know, you're going to a foreign country, well, what do I know, this guy's out there mm -hmm. 300 days a year. Mm -hmm. um, have you fished in Hawaii? No. Supposedly they have really big bonefish. Yes, but they Hawaii do. Has big and they're a different fish, species, so I think overall they're a little bigger. Mm -hmm. You're right. They're like, I think the golden bonefish or something. There are volumes written about different types of bonefish, but I'm talking about the coast ones. I know Christmas Island's got a lot of bonefish out there too, uh, about a thousand miles south of Hawaii. Anyway, a little bit about the uh, gear we need. Like I said, it's not that equipment intensive. But uh, you do have to have the right tools for the job. So we're going to cover a little bit of everything here. Rods. What rod to use? You go downstairs, I'm sure there's uh, over 100 rods on display down there. Which one would you pick for bonefish? Pretty much an 8 or a 9 weight rod is your go-to bonefish rod. Uh, no sense getting any larger, certainly you wouldn't want to go smaller, but you want a rod, a fast action rod with a saltwater anodized reel seat. And the reason you want the fast action rod is you want to be able to develop high line speed because it's probably going to be a little windy and make accurate casts. And you want a rod with enough backbone, stiff enough, so you can fight the fish. That when you do land, uh, hook up into a larger fish, you're able to fight it okay. So pretty much an eight or nine weight rod, the standard. We happen to use nines only because I have a lot of them. And uh, and you'll never go with just one rod, I hope. Yeah, you're never going with just one. So, But we may bring, for the two of us, we may bring five nine weight rods on a trip. Mm -hmm. And a couple of sevens. Well, you know, you gotta have the permit, the tarpon, a yeah. couple of bones. Yeah. And that's not because you expect to break any. Oh, no. no. Oh, okay. oh, no. Okay. It'll be a long speed. boat ride. For different it's species, right no. Luckily, uh, so you're we've, ready. I, as I think back, okay. I don't think we've ever broken a rod on a, on a bonefish trip. Okay. No, I just uh, jinxed myself. I was going to say, I do remember a time, but it was because of, um, remember down in the Bahamas a long time ago, it was because of the way that they stored the rods on the boat. Yeah, on the, that was. Okay. We've broken enough rods around here. <laughs> Uh, reels, which one? Again, this is where you don't want to skimp. I'd rather see somebody skimp on a rod than a reel. And when I mean skimp on a rod, there's nothing that you could buy at the Bears Den which would be a junky rod. What I mean, don't go to Walmart and buy a $49.95 special for your expensive bonefish trip. So get any quality rod that uh, Anything in the shop here would be a quality rod. The guys would tell you which one to get. But eight or nine weight rod. But for a reel, that's where you don't want to skim. You want a reel, a saltwater reel matched to the rod with a smooth drag. That is key. It has to have a smooth drag because that bonefish is going to run. Chill. I was just saying, it's about the startup. Yeah. And there, it, that has to be smooth startup. Smooth startup. The bonefish is going to go from zero to 25 in a matter of a couple of seconds. And if you're real, it's going to You stand a good chance of breaking it. Mm -hmm. So if I were going to skimp on anything, it would be the rod, not the reel. And again, uh, just a reel, it's uh, matched to the rod. Uh, also, you want the reel to be able to hold between, say, 150 and maybe 300 yards of backing. That's an incredible amount of backing, uh, 300 yards of backing. But a lot of people like to put a lot of backing on. We don't. I figure more than 200 yards of backing, that's fine. 
if that fish takes 300 yards of backing, 900 feet plus 100 feet fly line, that fish is 1,000 feet away, you've done something incredibly wrong. <laughs> and chances are you're not going to land the fish if he's almost a quarter of a mile away. So we don't tend to put a lot of backing on. I mean, we put enough, a couple of hundred yards, but just because my reel hole's 350 doesn't mean I have to put 350 on. Uh, in fact, I tend to have it fill a little bit less so that way when you're reeling up, in case you're not smooth, it doesn't have a hump on it and gives yourself all sorts of problems. Anything, Sheila? Go ahead, sir. So, so uh, one out of 10, how, so is it, when you get the fish, you're almost always gonna fight them on the reel. And that's like a really tough oh, mm -hmm. Is that like 100% or 90 95? Yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna put them on the reel. 99% okay. okay, okay. Great question. We'll, we'll be getting into that in a, a little okay. bit later. Okay. So that's about the reel. Again, at the end of the day, uh, which is good practice around here, remember you're in salt water, corrosive environment. I don't care if you have the greatest reel in the world, Give it a little rinse off. A lot of these places, fresh water is hard to find. You're not pulling into your marina and squirting it down with your hose. Uh, if you have anything left in your water bottle, you may want to wash it, or you may, uh, if it's really hot and sticky, you may want to just uh, bring it back to your hotel or lodge, rinse, take, uh, rinse the reel in the sink. The rods I'm not as concerned about because you can always clean the rod with a damp face cloth. But I try to rinse them every day, so they don't uh, jam up on the trip. And, sorry, I was just going to say about Go the ahead. fly line. No, you're right. You're right, right on to it. And now we're talking about the fly line. Again, I keep saying this is the most important. Well, this is key, too. It's all important. <laughs> That's why I like boat fishing. You want your fly line weight to match your rod. Remember I said eight or a nine weight rod? Well, you want to pick the fly line it matches the rod, eight or nine weight. Sheila and I, we do a lot of fishing, a lot of casting. We were never one to overline or underline a rod. If the engineer that designed that rod says, this is a nine weight, then I will put a nine weight line on it. So we're gonna use a, a matching size to the rod, and we're also gonna use a tropical fly line. In other words, a line that can take warm weather. The line you fish for trout in, in the Swift River or up in Maine, even though it's a floating line, and these are floating lines, when you put it on a 90 degree temperature on a hot deck of a boat or you're dragging it in the water, the line will, will turn into a plate of overcooked spaghetti. So you want to use a tropical fly line, and it's because of the core. The core and the fly line, it tend most of the, it'll be tightly wound or a solid core fly line. It just keeps that line a little stiff, even when it's 90 degrees. I talk about care of the line. Uh, at the end of the day, you may want to just uh, run the fly line through a wet face cloth or something like that, just to keep it clean for the next day. Because after four or five days, it can get a little sticky, it won't shoot as well. Manufacturers make it quite easy. <laughs> you know, bonefish, salt water taper, it's, it's pretty good. It may, uh, it may say flats taper or something like that. So you know that that's a tropical line. As opposed to a uh, floating line around here may say striped bass, yeah, sure, it'll work, but it won't work when it's hot and it's gonna be hot when you're fishing for bone fish. Leaders, key. Again, the most important thing. <laughs> now, leaders, uh, we use pretty much standard leaders, uh, maybe between nine and 12 feet, whatever I happen to have, usually between 10 or 12 pounds. I know there's an eight pound there in the picture, but usually between 10 and 12 pound tippet is all you need. Again, if you're unsure what leader to use, look at the picture on them. That'll say bonefish leader, or it may say saltwater taping leader. It makes it easy. Hey, Bill, are you using floral carbon? Coming right up. Thank you, sir. Next slide. <laughs> Thanks, I'll <Perfect> <laughs> yeah. um, 
with leaders in Tippett. Okay, so we have the we have the leader. Now you don't need a lot of leaders for a bonefish trip. A lot of people will go down there with you know 30 leaders. We bring three or four leaders for a week's worth of fishing because you start with your leader, whatever, 10, 10 feet long, uh, you change the flies, you snip it, uh, it gets caught in a bush, uh, you don't like the fly, you throw it away. Next thing you know, your 10 foot leader is now eight feet. So you gotta add some tippet. So we use the tippet spools. That's where I add the fluorocarbon. Uh, tip it. You could use mono. For years, people use mono. But now, fluoro is the uh, latest and greatest. And I'll tell you why. Fluorocarbon has three major benefits. Number one, it's less reflective to light. In bonefish, when they see something flashy, they think it's a barracuda. They don't like cudas. So it's less reflective to light, number one. Number two, it's more abrasion resistant. So if it happens to go across a, a mangrove or a piece of coral, it's not going to break as easy. It's uh, just a little bit tougher. And number three, it sinks. Fluorocarbon sinks, which is great because, as Sheila mentioned earlier, the bonefish feed on the bottom. So when you cast that fly and you have a piece of fluoro on it, even though you're in knee-deep water, it still takes you know, five to ten seconds to get down there. Now, if you had mono, mono will work, but not as well as fluoro. So in answer to your question, I tend to use fluoro just for the uh, tippet. I don't buy a whole fluoro leader, probably because I'm cheap. <laughs> Anything how, do you, you how, do you, how do you attach the fluoro to the mono? Good question. Uh, we get some knots coming up, but I use the same knots. I've never had a problem for the mono. Uh, you know, in the, you are correct, sir, that in theory, you're not supposed to mix materials. In I've, reality, I've never had a problem. I mean, test my knots. I mean, even around here, I just will use uh, a blood knot or a surgeon's knot. Or some people call it a double surgeon's knot, mm -hmm. same thing, to tie it. I've never had one slip on me. Again, with the knots. There are volumes written about knots, plenty of books. Luckily, with bone fishing and saltwater fishing, you only really have to know a few. Uh, back into fly line, media connection, adding tippet and tying to the fly. Now, most fly lines, as you've probably seen, now come with loops on the end of it, and most leaders come with loops. So you can just do a little loop-to-loop -loop thing to connect them. Yeah, that's great. Until you find a leader that doesn't have a, a loop on the end of it, or uh, if it gets caught in the coral. Yeah, or if it gets caught in the coral, if you break the end of your fly line and you go, oh, geez, I lost my loop. So it's good to know uh, either a nail knot or a uni knot or an Albright knot. These are really simple knots to learn to tie the uh, leader to the fly line. The backing to the fly line, I mean, you're only going to do that once. And again, an Albright knot, WE knot, that all work. Uh, to add tippet, I tend to use, depending on how much time I have and how much I'm in a rush, either a surgeon's knot, which is a double overhand knot, or uh, a blood knot. Very simple, easy to tie, and then I can keep adding tippet to my leader. So if I put on a leader at the end of a week of fishing, if I didn't damage it, that leader's still good. I've had some uh, saltwater season, saltwater leaders I've used here for, for months before I feel the need to change the whole leader. I just keep changing the, uh, the business end. And What's too short? Eight what? feet? You adding it eight feet, seven feet? Uh, too short? I, Eight feet is about as short as I go. I try to keep it I mean, ten. the thing is, you kind of get feedback every day, and if there are times you can find yourself with a twelve foot leader, yeah. so I wouldn't let it get to eight feet. To be honest with you, I personally, I'm like all about a longer leader. As long as your fly is turning over, I have never had stealth compromised because I had a longer leader. <clears throat> longer is better, but you know. 10 feet, like she says, is good, but if you're adding tippet, you got, I might as well put on 12 and you know, keep it going. As long as that fly is turning over, which you'll get into in the yeah. casting segment. 
Uh, again, don't lose a fish due to a bad knot. There's really no excuse for it. Tie the knot, test the knot, pull it, but when you test the knot, don't, don't just go wham, 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 because that'll probably break the, uh, the tippet. Just pull it and put gentle pressure on it. Hold it, four or five pounds of pressure for four or five seconds. If it holds, it's going to work. Just always test your knot. Flies. Can I ask so, more question? Yes. Uh, how are you tying, how are you tying uh, the tippet to the fly? Are you putting a loop in there or straight? straight? I'm either using a loop knot or a uh, improved clinch knot. Yeah. I never. I, I don't like to use a loop when it comes to our, my bow fishing because you, you don't want that up. You don't want a tremendous amount of action. You, you kind of want a more direct control over the movement of the fly. You know what I'm saying? Because you're not using a bait fish. You, most of the time you're using like a crab or a shrimp, something like a hard shell type thing. So I tie it tight to the fly. Yeah. Yeah, improve. Same knot you use around here. But occasionally, like if you were using a swimming, uh, swimming fly, then I may want to use uh, a little loop knot. But in the last uh, couple weeks ago when we were fishing, we didn't use any of these. Uh, equipment flies. Bonefish eat flies, obviously, like any fish, because they think it's food. Um, and it, it's pretty easy with bonefish because they're either shrimp, crabs, or bait fish. Now, uh, in South America, in Venezuela, bait, oops, bait fish with a prevalent fly. Uh, gummy minnows, glass minnows, they loved bait fish down there. But in Cuba, in Mexico, in Belize, it's mostly uh, what I call shrimp patterns, crazy charlies, gotchas pink puffs. You may want little little crabs. They don't have to be massive permit crabs. Little dime-sized crabs. Uh, you'll see them downstairs. They have a good selection. I call them Kathy crabs or little green crabs, little fur crabs. It's about the size of a dime. That's all. And again, when I say clouses, not the same kind of clouses. Big flies are used for stripers around here. Smaller clouses. <coughs> little bait fish in the tins. It's always good to have a few with you because you never can tell. Maybe you start to see some snappers or jacks and you'll be glad to have some, some clauses with you. Uh, the key thing to know with the flies are, you may want to have different weights with the flies. By that I mean some flies are tied with bead chain eyes, which is still sinks but sinks a little slow, and some flies are tied with lead eyes. They sink a little faster. You know, it's nice to have a few of each. What's, it, what's the hook size on that, yeah. most of those? Uh, where I've been fishing, Mexico, Belize, it's usually six and eights, ten okay. to the smaller size. In the Bahamas, they go a little bit bigger. They go to fours. But six and eights, I mean, you can catch huge fish with a tiny hook. Mm. But six and eights, that's kind of rare. I don't even think I own a, a two or a four. Again. Puff Charlie's gotchas, those, those little cappy crabs that I talked about, little inexpensive, that's about the size of a dime. Okay, when you go on a bonefish trip, over the years we've amassed too many flies. Because <laughs> uh, I just keep tying them or buying them or people give them to me. So I may take six or seven big boxes of flies but I don't want to carry those around with me all the time if I'm walking. Even in the boat, I don't want to look at a fly and I'm like, you're never going to have everything in it. But I mean, with a few gotchas and charlies and you see a couple of crabs and a couple of swimming flies there, I'm in pretty good shape that if I have to get out of the boat and walk on a flat with a guy for an hour or two or half an hour, I don't have to take big boxes. I can put that in my shirt pocket or in my little uh, fanny pack and know I'm good. I mean, if I'm going to lose 30 flies in an hour, then I probably should take the rest of the day off. <laughs> now, are you, you have a question? Yes. Uh, on the fly side? Sure. Do you take flies for, like, if it's overcast, semi-overcast, or it's just a bright, sunny day? Does that, does that have an effect on that, the flies? That's all color. I use white, pink, or brown. Right. That's it. 
that said Uncle Pepper. White pink or brown. Ma maybe uh, this, you know, <coughs> chartreuse would be better. But most, if you look downstairs, all those bonefish flies are going to be pretty much white, pink, or brown. Okay. And the guy will tell you, oh, today white or today brown. I mean, they're, they're fishing. Hopefully, they're fishing a lot, so they should know. Again, that's a classic case of I have a bunch of fly boxes with me, and that's not all of them. Uh, but I will take these flies and then put them into a little easy box, so just to have. And I always take an opportunity box. Those are not really bonefish flies. Some of those are striper flies. You see some poppers in there. Just because you never can tell what you're going to see. You may see some big jacks crashing. And the big jacks aren't going to take those little tiny flies right there. So you, you give them something a little bit bigger. And since, since we're using a nine-way rod, no problem to catch them. But I call that the opportunity box. And I always bring one with me. Sometimes you don't use it, but it's good to have. Personal view. I think this is you. Yes, so I put this slide in just so you can be thinking that you have to prepare your, yourself too. You know, you're part of the equation. So you want to think about, you know, your hat. So your hat is obviously to cut the glare because when you're we're going to be talking about finding fish, you don't want any glare. You want to be able to see through the water. Polarize, you cannot spend, you can spend too much, but you cannot like get too good a quality sunglasses. That really makes a difference when you can see what the texture is, where the fish are. Um, and you know, and we'll talk about this, but one thing you can do is you can train yourself to see other things that might be moving. It might be a crab, it might be a turtle, it might be a box fish, it might be a snapper, but get your eyes to learn to, oh, oh, there's a fish, you know, and that way you can start to learn. Um, obviously you need your sunscreen, you're not used to it, bug spray. Because even though you're out on the ocean, sometimes you might find yourself in mangroves and, oh Lord, those bugs. <laughs> uh, a nice little pack to be able to keep them all in. Pliers, nice wading boots, some kind of wading boot where you're, you can um, protect your foot from coral. So this, you don't want to get like the Walmart special little slipper socks or water socks that you can wear into a pool because one step on the coral, they're gone, and then your foot has no protection. And then we always wear rain jackets, just so you sure. know that. Can you talk about sunglass color? I like a more amber type of, or brown, not like a bright, like a um, shooting type of color. I find it kind of covers a good range, so it, it has really good contrast. I don't like a blue. Blue is more for offshore for me. I don't want it really bright because I'm only going to bring one pair. Well, I bring more than one pair, but only one pair of prescription sunglasses. And I choose to get them in a more brown or slight amber, but not yellow. Sometimes they call the color copper, too. Yeah, that's Same right. Thing. That's right. Yeah, that's what I like. I don't know what you've found. Have you found something that you like? Well, I have both. I have a, a blue pair. Yeah. Um, that yeah, like you said, most people say it's for offshore, yeah. but I generally use the uh, amber ones. Yeah. Yeah. So seeing bonefish, and this is, this, you're going to hear this about a thousand times in, you, in your uh, trip, so that I don't see him, where is he, you know? So <laughs> we're going to just talk about the difference between boat versus wading for a couple of things. So from a boat, you have the advantage of height. That's the lovely thing about a boat. You have the advantage of height to be able to look down and try to see the fish through the water or an indication of the fish. And that indication might be a little bit of a wake, which, you know, you can see. I, not every fish, you don't always get a school of fish, so there's 25, there might be one or two. So, you know, sometimes it can be very subtle. So that's a nice thing. And a lot of times a guy will stand right up there with you. Again, seeing fish, all of these little spots have some fish in them. This one's got a fish. So you, you'd see that little splash. That's unusual, but occasionally you might. I can't find the one in here, but this has got to be one maybe right there. And sometimes they'll be right on the edge, and they may came, come in and out. So just that it's not easy. Even the guys like staring off. Now, in a word about how do you find those fish? You need to have a searching pattern. So now you're you're like the guys in the, the hurricane finder plane. You are searching. So I think of it as like a cone of vision, like a V. You want to search from near to far, from left to right, right to left, and from far to near. 
So you'll find that you are going to tend to look at the exact same um, distance all the time. Like, like, like you might go like, oh, I'm going to, like, I want the fish to be here because I can cast here, so I'm going to keep looking here. And you forget that the fish will be over there, and they're always moving. So you want to look out there to see if you see anything, but you also want to come back here because maybe you didn't see them. It's a moment in time when you see that fish, and if your eyes don't lock on them, you're not, you may not pick them up again. So just to keep that in mind. And I constantly remind myself, like I'm always saying, left, right, near, far, you know, and just to really be ready for that. How, how often do you see them tail? So that is a water depth issue, and that's somewhat to your question in terms of, you know, the color, not so much the color, but the size of the fly. So um, it really depends on where you are and what the stage of tide is, of course. So how often, the last trip we were on, we, were on, we saw most of all the fish, and every fish that we caught was all tailing fish. Mm -hmm. Every, oh my God, so yes. Less than a foot of water? Or? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Like about, what, six inches, maybe. Eight, yeah, eight like inches. ankleish. Yeah. You know, so or maybe a little deeper. You know, you know what I'm saying. I do have a question, kind of like this gentleman was talking about. Have you ever just walked up on them? I know. Oh no, there's like, no, no, it's not happening. <laughs> no, no, no. So, <laughs> see, this, see this comment about like quiet or he'll yeah. hear you. So remember, so it's funny. They're all just. They're always scared. They're always scared. They're always worried that something's going to get them. So when you wading a flat, you need to shuffle your feet a lot. You don't pick them up and put them in the water again. You know you have to, or if you did, you have to go, you know, toe first. You really have to be careful with that shuffling. And sometimes you'll be on coral and you'll hear it crunch. Uh, you don't talk a lot. Don't laugh. This is some of Bill's favorite time. He'll never see me shut up for so much time because I'm like. Like it's I very quiet when she fishes. Oh yeah, like you don't even want to talk a lot. You don't. Even, you know, you're not like hollering already to your buddy. Hey, how's it going? You know, you're like very, very, very quiet. So, and also on a boat, you might be on a boat. You got to be so careful. You don't slam down things. You don't. You don't like miss your step. You don't slam the cooler shut. Everyone's quiet because all of that sound transmits. You are not going to stumble. Now that said you will not see the fish and suddenly find them here. And you're like, shoot, what am I gonna do? Because okay. not every fish is on the other side. So this is not like, say, Monvoy. Not you at all. Like you can walk up on the strap. No. Oh, no. No, oh, no. Is... oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. These guys happen. know they're in eight inches of water, okay. so they're a little bit paranoid anyway. Okay. And for the most part, if you see them really close to you, so what's close, 20 feet? If you see them 20 feet, all of a sudden, you'll want to do a little flip roll cast, and you will, but you very rarely catch them, because then you got to strip them back, and they're coming towards mm. where you are, you know what I'm saying? So the mm. stealth part is tough. Thank you. Um, I'm just trying to think what else I said. Now, the upside about waiting is it's, a, it's, first of all, a very intimate type of situation where you're really stalking a fish, but also you have the advantage of being quiet. You know, the boat makes some, you know, the engine's off usually, and they're pulling the boat, but still leaving the waves slapping against the boat make a little bit of noise. So we've talked about this, so I'm going to kind of go through this one kind of quickly. Fishing from a boat, keep in mind, this, you're going to be up the front of the boat. That's a small little area. I just want you to know, don't, don't go off, you know. Um, this is the classic way that they'll talk about fishing to, to the fish. A clock face. 12 is dead ahead of the boat. Nine on the left, three on the right. The guide will almost always position you for a cast a little bit off 12 to nine. If he does see a fish over here, he's going to turn the boat. So your cast is still, as a right-handed caster, only one pre, I know this couple are lucky, one's right and one's left. I'm like, you guys are both going to be fishing the whole time. <laughs> but you don't usually get a partner like that. So they're almost always going to set it up for your right-handed caster. It's going to be at this kind of an angle. They'll just adjust where the boat is. Um, the other thing Bill always reminds me is that this is always 12 o'clock of the boat. So you're stand, you might be standing out there looking, and the boat, the bow of the boat is this way, and he says 12 o'clock. He doesn't mean in front of you. You got to look at where the 12 of the boat is, just to remind that. And they will call it out as direction, time on, time on the clock, and then distance. Okay. 
And those of you who have cast with me before, you know that's one of the reasons I'm such a big fan of marking the fly line. I always, then you have some idea of how far away the fish really is, you know. All right, so fishing from a boat, the nice thing is you've got the stealth. Again, the guide might be right beside you, pointing where you need to go. Then you have the height advantage of playing the fish. This is another one. This, this one was click, 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 so you could see that you were taking a photo of your fish, and then you weren't. Weeding, he might be walking right beside you, okay? And so it's nice because then they can point right there. You can even take your rod and point it. Is that where you mean? Because sometimes, I don't know, you know, they're going to say 10 o'clock and you'll be like, and they're like, no, over here. <laughs> I'm like, all right. You know, so, they, so at least you're putting your cast where you want it to go. And then hopefully you hook up. All right, so this, I'm going to let Bill talk about actually playing the fish and what to do when you get into business. One thing I want to add about uh, seeing the fish that Sheila just talked about is chances are at first you're not going to see them as well. It takes a while to do it. Just trust the guide. If he says, you know, 40 feet at 11 o'clock, cast 40 feet at 11 o'clock. After you do it for a little bit of time, maybe it takes a day, maybe it takes an hour, maybe it takes three days, you'll get to see better as you look through the water. So let's talk about what we do. We cast to the fish, we strip, and we do the hook set. When you're casting to the fish, there's short strips. The guide will say, you make your cast, you let the fly sink to the bottom, little short six inch strips. He'll, he'll pretty much tell you what to they do. He basically coach you through it. Yeah, he may say long strips, or, but usually 90% of the time they're short strips, and the hook set is done by the strip. The rod is pointed low. If you're on the boat, you notice my rod angle is down. If you're standing up, the rod angle is still down. That tip can be in the water. It's not going to hurt anything. Good strip strike with your stripping hand. Get tight to the fish. Get through the line. That line is tight. I've just set the hook before you do your next important step, which is where most people lose fish, and that's clearing the line. The object is to get the fish on the reel. Now remember, you've just, you've stripped off, I don't know, 50 foot of feet of line. Yes? I'm just gonna say, make sure you tell them about not holding on. You, this is not a strike bass. You don't get to like, you know, set uh, the hook. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. When you give it that strip strike, I'm getting into this now, I'm clearing up. You hook, you're tight to the fish. Say you've made, uh, you've had 50 feet of line at your feet. You've made, I don't know, 30 foot cast. Nice, simple cast. Now you have 20 feet of line there. You've set the hook, you're tight to the fish. That fish, once he realizes he got stung, he's going to take off. 99% of the time, he's gonna run away from you, which is good. You kind of, with your line hand, let the fish take line, but give it a little bit of pressure. Don't just release it, because if you release that 20 feet of line, it'll hook on your on your boot, on your reel, on the end of the rod tip. So, rod butt. On the rod butt, thank you. So clear the line, as we like to say. Let the fish take it. Give it a little bit of pressure on and off. He'll take it. It'll, this will all happen within a few seconds. But the goal is to get the fish onto the reel so you can fight the fish. He'll just One. point out, I wanted to just point you, see how he mimicked with his hands? You keep them separated so that as the line is jumping up on your line hand side, it's less likely to jump up and wrap around your rod. Mm -hmm. That's right why there. the hands are separated. And you can see my hands are separated. I can see the line, it's in front of me. I'm well aware where the line is as I let it go with my left hand, let it go slowly as the bonefish takes it out so I can get him on the reel. Uh, this is the time where you could step through it, step on it, it could catch on anything, but I got lucky there and it didn't. The goal is to get the fish on the reel. Once the fish is on the reel, we fight it just like any other fish. Uh, yes. So when you're clearing back to clearing the line, after you set and you have them on, and he's taking line, do you actually like 
move your hands apart and oh, yeah. your left yeah. line go through your hand. Okay. Yeah, I kind of definitely move my hands apart so I can see where that line is. I don't. But you're you're letting the hand the line go through your hand. I'm letting the line go through my hand with light pressure. I'm not just like letting it go, <coughs> even like this. It's kind of like easy. I'm letting them pull a little bit. I'm not walking around. So they basically, they'll so put themselves mostly, on the, they'll put themselves mostly they'll put themselves if he's the running fast, you're just they're being, they're being they're a guide yeah. with your hand. Nope. But if he stops, you want to be able to pinch it down. Yeah. Because what if he stops and starts to run at you? Yeah. Dang fish. Yeah, mo most <laughs> of the time, he's, he's going to do that. Now, there is the rare occasion where you'll hook the fish and he's going to run right at you. In that case, you just have to strip it in like as, as fast as you can. But chances are, at some point, he's going to turn and run away. I've never had one run at me and decided to go, OK, I'm, I'm coming in. And usually you get three runs. Yeah. So well, I mean, they'll, they're going to run sometime. And if he's run at you and he takes off, that's even worse, because now you have more line you have to clear. Uh, we put the fish on the reel. Once I have the fish on the reel, uh, I happen to be on a shoreline there. I'm walking the fish uh, down the beach because I'm not on a boat, so I'm just kind of keeping good tension on them. Uh, I don't want to put a lot of pressure because remember, we're only using 10 to 12 pound tippet. I'm walking them down the beach. We're fishing again. Uh, good bend in the rod here. That's If you notice this rod, that's where the Anything that's pointed towards the fish, the flexible tip, doesn't help you fight the fish. The thing that's helping you fight the fish is the, uh, the stiff part of the rod, the middle, and in this case, the butt end. Waiting, same thing. We may have some obstacles around that once that fish is on the reel, she has to hold it way up there because if you see those little mangroves there, eh, the fish aren't stupid. Uh, they're going to try to hook around him and, and either break your tippet or injure, you know, uh, bust up your fly line or something like that. That happens. So what I can tell what she's doing there is keeping that line away from the uh, mangroves. I'm chasing them. Chasing the fish too. It is a good idea. Someone asked about water depth. You can see it's below our knees. Again, playing the fish right here, uh, there's sideways pressure about that, and that uh, photo there, the fish is taken off. So my hand is off the reel, because the reels, as the fish takes off, the reel is going to spin very quickly, and you don't want to injure yourself. So when I grab the handle of the reel, I'm only using a couple of fingers. Uh, Quickly, with some of the reels that are left and right hand retrieve, I say you should retrieve with the hand you can reel the fastest with. Some right hand people say, well, that's why I reel with my right hand. I'm a right handed caster, but I think I've trained myself over the year to reel very fast if I have to with my left hand. You know, when, I have a question about drag. Does the guy help you decide on how to set your drag? Before you go out? Uh, he will if you ask him, but as a rule, drag, drag settings are uh, one third the breaking strength of the tippet. Uh, so if you're, if you're fishing with uh, whatever, 12 pound tippet, about four pounds of drag. Four pounds of drag is a it's lot. It's a lot. It's a lot of drag. Uh, so even when we fish for marlin and sailfish on a fly, we we're, were using 20 pound tippet, and again, five or six pounds of drag is all we use for sailfish. So you're not stopping a train. Five pounds of pressure is a lot. Again, a uh, good example of that's what's doing all the work, putting the pressure on the fish. You want to keep pressure on the fish and keep reeling. When you're resting, he's resting. Again, she's palming the reel. When that reel's going out, she's adding a little bit of drag by just touching the reel. And you gotta be careful when you do that because you don't wanna jam the reel, but you can palm it a little bit. If you think he's really uh, running out of drag, you can put a little more pressure without adjusting the little knob. You may see people do that, but that's what they're doing. Landing and releasing the fish, I was, 
obviously alone then. I bring the fish in close to me, and as I, I'm stripping it in the last few feet, but I'm ready that sometimes when the fish sees you, he may decide to take off again. So I can instantly release the line, and I'm, I'm careful. I'm not going to trip on it. I find it easier to pick up bonefish. It, it settles them down if I pick them up upside down. It doesn't make for a great picture, but it disorients the fish. So you pick him up out of the water, he's upside down, he tends to settle down. Makes it easy to uh, retrieve the hook. He'll do this for you, that's his job. If he's there, but he wasn't. Again, release the fish, take your picture. There's another great shot how he just blends into the water. Uh, you don't shake the fish back and forth because that gives them oxygen and then drowns them. You tend to kind of push them in one direction. Most of these fish, if you land them quickly, once you put them in the water, he'll, he'll fly away. But just a good looking release really shot. Just All right, so a little bit about wouldn't, wouldn't be casting. a cast 90 uh, presentation if we didn't talk about casting. But I'm gonna kind of pick it up just a little bit. Yeah, it's, it is really warm. Um, so I like this, yeah, you can just leave it open, that's all right. So I like this picture because if, if you look closely, this guy's having a really hard, oh, if that's your cast, you're really having a hot day, let me tell you. And this, but this guy already gave up. He wanted to see so that's not good. All right, so I'm just going to touch just a little bit on something to think about for your casting. So sorry about that, sorry about that. Um, so a couple of key things to keep in mind is an awareness of your environment. That means where are the obstacles? Where is it, where's the fish likely to be? Where are you likely to have to put a cast? You know what I'm saying? So, so like, even though I'm not the guy, I'm like, you're exhausted at the end of the day because you're always thinking, you're always looking, you're trying to figure it out. Oh my God, what am I going to do if they come in here? And have the guy say to me the last time we were fishing, her, oh, put a cast in. I, and I'm like, no, I knew I could make the cast. That's not the point. Three mangroves, and he was in the middle of that V. I'm never getting that fly line back, and that's another 100 bucks, so I'm not doing that. <laughs> so you've got to be aware of that, and knowledge of the fish's behavior, and then line management. That is so important. Um, wind and obstacles, just to think about it. You, it we've talked about the, the, excuse me, the fish's behavior, just the fact that you know they're going to be head down. You know they're going to be head down, you know they're going to be rooting down. That's why when you cast, you give it a moment for that fly to settle. How long will depend on what's the depth of the water and what's going on that day. It's never the same, of course. Readiness, mentally ready all the time. If you spend any time bone fishing, which I know some of you had, you know this feeling. You're, you're standing there and you're ready. You spend a heck of a lot more time being ready than actually casting to the fish. That's just the number of hours in a day. So you're standing and then you look and you're like, how did that line get in its own little tank? Like you haven't done a thing. How did it get into tangle? If you're waiting, you're going to find that the, it can pick up debris as you drag it along. So having your line always ready to fish is really important. One of the reasons I like this slide is you can see that when you're stripping your line in, you don't just like throw it any old way. You have to carefully keep it in a nice, neat little pile. That's what you have to do with your, your line to be ready. And this is just an example of I'm standing waiting for your turn. You know, that, that kind of thing. The line management again. So here's Bill very carefully stripping the line off. He puts it right here. So you've got to, they tend to not have stripping baskets a lot of time. So you have to kind of designate where's your pile of line and then not step on it as you'll see. <laughs> but also notice he's very carefully, we're going to talk about this, holding. How do you manage the line? The, in, you and I had worked on this. Part of the thing is you want to manage the line so that you hold the fly and then you might have a loop or two here so that you have some line out of the rod. You cannot, when it's your turn, you cannot say, okay, and then go, you know, and, and make like six or eight false casts. If, oh, you, these guys, you're paying them, but they will give you an ear. Okay, you are not going to do that. You got to get that done ideally in two maybe three false casts, that's it. So you need some line out of your uh, rod tip to be able to make that cast with fewer moves. This is a classic one, especially if you're wearing boots, which I do sometimes in the boat. You can step on the line, you don't even feel it. So you just, you're like constantly checking to make sure you're ready. That is huge. 
You can see here that I'm, even when I'm waiting, I've got lines secured underneath this hand, and then this is the line that I would be making the cast with. I make a couple loops, hold it by the bend, you can see those loops here, and then as I weed along, you just have to make sure that whatever extra line I'm dragging doesn't pick up weed, and sometimes it does because it's that shallow. So you're always, always, always ready, always thinking about where are you going to be? Where is your cast likely to be? So a few other things I have to think a about is, yes? Why do we use stripping baskets up here almost everywhere you go? Somebody has one waiting, and yet down there it's a different well, ethic? You know, you know, I think it's just like, whatever became in, in, in vogue or in style, in part. But I will say it would be a real pain to have to pack a stripping basket on it to go on a trip, you know? Like you have so much gear and it's big and it's bulky. And it does provide a lovely spot for things to get stuck in. So it, that might be it. It's I, a great I, idea to, to use yeah. a stripping basket when you're waiting. Uh, stripping buckets like around here, uh, as a charter captain, we have stripping buckets on the boat that we use. Sometimes you'll see those in the Florida Keys, but they haven't made it to to Mexico and, and yeah. the bomb. It's a great idea. I wish but they would. But it's a funny thing. It's like, you know, in trout fishing, like, you always have your vest. But in, in, and then you go saltwater fishing, and you're like, you just put your stuff in your pockets. <laughs> you, you know? Who knows? Okay. I think also... Up here, yeah. your line's a lot more likely to get caught on pebbles on the beach oh, or, 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 or mung in the water, yeah. as opposed to down there where the water's clear and the beach is sandy and yeah. nothing much to stick up. Yeah. To, catch and, on. to add to what he's saying, there's yeah. no surf. Yeah. So oh, well, right, you know what? I'll tell you, that's is, not always true because that, they're not always on these pristine flats. Okay. It depends on what area. Sometimes you might fish the edge of a channel because maybe there's there's some fish in there or on the edge of a flat. So there can be a little bit of a surf, believe it or not. It's not the classic, which is why we didn't talk about what we see up here. Right. right. No, okay. no, no, nothing like that. Okay. I don't want to get distracted. So this is what I wanted to show you. This is what you want to do. You want to lead your fish. Ideally, your fly is here. You see the fish is coming here, so you have to anticipate what is this distance going to be for any given day. Water clarity, temperament of the fish, depth of the water. The more shallow, and also if you do, we were talking about tailing fish. I have found that when you're casting to tailing fish, you have to put, you know, you're so afraid of scaring the fish, but you have to put that fly like so ridiculously close that it makes me nervous. You know, that's how close you have to get it. Or they just don't see it because they're head down. So it's, it's sort of an interesting thing. So here is if you're too wide, this is what happens. Fish just goes on, travel on by, he never sees it. You know, it's not right, especially if he's head down. This is the worst, lining your <laughs> fish. And that's when you find out that he had, you know, uh, 30 of his best friends with him, and now you've got that many less people around to, you know, fish to fish for. Um, this is your ideal presentation. When you're practicing your casting, yes, nice idea to have some kind of like a, a hula hoop or something like that, but remember, it's not okay to put it anywhere in here. That's not really practicing your accuracy. Then this accuracy becomes much more like your trout fishing, where you're like, I have to put it dead center here. You'd practice putting it here. Maybe the fish comes from here. You'd practice putting it here. You'd practice putting it there. Slight differences. That's what I would say. All right. Double haul is a fabulous skill to have because in general, although you will have some fish that are very close, you're going to be one cast distance and with wind. So the double haul is great. I'm not saying you can't fish for it without double haul, but I'm saying when it comes to distance, at some point, everyone maxes out until you add the double haul, and then you'll be able to increase your distance. So it's just something to work towards. Um, and shooting line, this is what I wanted to say about shooting line. People forget that when you're shooting line for a longer cast, it takes long, more time for that line to shoot. It's not like shoot a little bit and just put it down. So hold that rod tip up for a little bit so that you can get the benefit of all that line shooting out so your cast is as long as it can be. Okay? Um, and this is it. Yeah, the fish is, you see, I love this one. Yeah, he's way over there. That, that's where I want you to look. But And you might you kind of think, oh, maybe the fish will be right here, and maybe he's right in there, or maybe he's around something. You know, there's all, 
all sorts of things. And the distance, of course, means you have to have a deeper bend or deeper load in the rod so that you have that more energy. Okay. Um, let's see, and it needs to be efficient. So just a reminder, start with your rod tip low so that you get your rod bent right away. I did not, I would be about halfway up and that rod's got a good load in it. So just remember that, okay? Um, and then wind and obstacles are two things to always be thinking about. And so I'd like to give you just a couple of quick little options to think about. And of course, everybody knows sidearm casting, but you may not think of this as something that you might need when you're bone fishing. <coughs> and that could be on the flat where you're horizontal and you're just above the water, but you can also use it on a boat. So keep that in mind. People don't tend to think about it. Sometimes you, you might have to cast off this side of the boat. Sometimes you might cast along this way. To, but a sidearm can be very good, and it kind of cuts the wind a little bit, so that's why I like that one. This is one people don't often think about, what we call casting in two planes, I meaning I might pick it up horizontal. This would be for wind on my casting side. Pick it up horizontal, and then you use this thing called drift where you slide up and around, and then you can present it very accurately at your target. And the wind kind of helps bring it around like that. Right? Delivering the fly in the bath cast. A lot of saltwater anglers are used to this, and then you don't think about it, but like that might be the best choice for you when you're fishing, you know, when you, even when you're bone fishing. They don't expect it, but and you know you're not necessarily gonna do it when you do, but you've been fishing for a while, just put that in your, your thought process, okay? Um, off shoulder casting. Oh, I love the off shoulder casting. You have to have good shoulders, range of motion wise, but this is so helpful. <laughs> I know, exactly. Because you may have some obstacles. See how if I tried to put that cast on my right hand side, I'd be in the mangroves before you know it. Switch that over, just tilt it right over to the backhand side, and it's not a problem. And then you got to remember you got to guide in the back of the boat. So if you're in the back of the boat, typically you have a guide right here pulling you along, but you don't have to worry about him because all of your casting should be from like, you know, I guess 11.58 to 9. So that you should always have the um, line over the water, okay? That if you hit the guy with the fly, <laughs> that's it. How much extra do you have to pay? <laughs> yeah, a yeah. lot. I did that. The first oh, time a I went lot. Down the oh, they're not happy. <laughs> the not happy at all. Oh, not happy. So this is, um, and the other thing I want to talk about, just very briefly, with the um, casting, is this thing I, that's called the quick cast. And you could just, you, you know, it's in my book, it's in Joan's book, it's in a lot of different books. How do you manage your line? This is all about having about 30 feet of line out before you even start your cast, okay? So you've got it tagged underneath here. I told you about holding it by the bend of the hook of the fly and making loops. The loops have to be different sizes. If they're all the same, they'll just spin around in the breeze. But if they're different lengths, then you can, it's sort of like river loops, if anybody uses river loops, when you're fishing long stretches of river, um, truck fishing, and you have to manage a, a long line, it, that you would do the same kind of thing. But then you also have to have your pile of line here. So most guides will say, cast your distance cast. They get to see what you can do, okay? But then when you strip the line back in, you're taking in the line that will be on the bottom of the pile so that the closest line is on the top and will shoot out first. Otherwise, it's gonna be underneath and it's gonna to tend to tangle when you shoot the line. And then when it's, so you're staying there forever in a day waiting for your turn and finally there's a target for you. You sweep the rod up and back. You make a back cast. When you come forward, you try to reach the line. If you can, you'll haul and you might even shoot some line on the back cast. And then you'll haul and shoot it all on the forward cast. And then you're casting 60 or 70 feet like that, two casts. Then the fish has to cooperate. All right. So preparation is one of the most important things because we want we don't want to just have luck. Well, I'll take it. We want to have skill. That's what we want to develop. So when you do practice, make sure that you practice before you trip. Practice with the gear that you're going to use. Use your target <coughs> to practice in the wind, just so that you're really ready for it. And then some great references. All of these are just classic, classic great bonefish. Um, and I would say that this Dick Brown book is like phenomenal if you get your hands on that one. And then um, just you know, learning as much as you can. 
And I don't know if you want to add anything, and then we could take questions from folks. I forget where the lights are. Uh, right behind you, the top switch. Thank you. No. And when you talk about locations, uh, there's no longer fly fishing in Biscayne Bay. Other oh, fish. there is. Sure. So the bonefish is still down in Biscayne Bay. Yeah, they don't have a lot of them. They're really hard to catch. Oh, but yes, yeah. yeah. Sometimes I like them dumb and agreeable. <laughs> what can I say? Yeah, I mean, it's back. We used to fish the Keys all the time. Now people still fish the Keys. It's a great place to fish. The big fish, but they're not as easy to catch as they were 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Their pound. Well, let me take another question, and then anybody who want, needs to leave, I totally get it. You know, there's not enough hours in every day, right? That I want to let you go. Uh, I just have one more question. You say you fish with a nine weight, uh, but presentation and stuff is everything. I'm just curious why you don't fish with a seven then. Wind, just wind and wind. distance. All right. Generally speaking, you know, you can it's throw like a seven weight a long way though. Excuse me. I'm sure you can throw a seven weight plenty far. Yeah, but you know, you, you got to do everything fast. You know, and it's. Some days you have a lot of opportunities. Some days not so many, as you guys know. We'll and bring so seven weights on a trip. We'll always, I think we brought two seven weights on our last trip, just to be, you know, if the conditions are nice and something like that, we'll go with the seven. But for us, a, a nine foot nine is like a, it's like a go-to rod. I mean, it feels good. I mean, eight would probably be better, but eh, we own the nines. Um, the long head, short head, short bellies on the lines. I like a standard, something standard. that's got a head length of about 40, 40 feet. feet. I don't like a really short one yeah. because from for our experience, one time you're casting 20 feet, then 8, 30, 8, mm. 20. You know, and it's like you just can't keep accommodating for that. And the, you know, those short heads, they're harder to cast they're for fast, long distances. Yeah. Yeah. And Rio makes a line, it's probably our go-to bonefish line now. There's a lot of great bonefish lines the guys will tell you downstairs. We use the Rio Flats Pro line. Great line, casts well, we've had good luck with it. All right, I, I can, I, I'm, I'm, we're staying to answer questions, but I don't want anyone to feel awkward about leaving. I want to thank everybody for coming. If you want to follow us on Instagram, it's SheCast90 on Instagram. What's your website? Um, and our website is Cast90. There's cards also on the way out um, that have our, our info on it. And we'll be at the Marlboro Show January 5th. It's January 5th oh. this year. Yeah, crazy time, right after the holidays. Is, is anybody here new to the bears that you've all been And then feel before? free to go. Everybody's been here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much for coming. Appreciate it.